going to do my very favorite thing in the world, in my very favorite place in the world, in front of some of my very favorite people in the world. So, and I'll start with somebody else. Uh, where do we got this thing? Start out with William Butler Yeats, the host of the air. This is the first Yeats poem I ever heard. My father, like whenever he got loaded, would put on Tommy Makem and the Clancy Brothers, which means we listened to Tommy Makem and the Clancy Brothers a lot. Um, and this, uh, Liam Clancy did this on their Carnegie Hall recording. It's called The Host of the Air. O'Driscoll drove with a song, The Wild Duck and the Drake, from the tall and tufted reeds of the drear heart lake. And he saw how the reeds drew dark at the coming of evening tide, and dreamed of the long dim hair of Bridget his bride. And he heard while he sang and dreamed a piper piping away. And never was piping so sad and never was piping so gay. And he saw young men and young girls who danced on a level place, and Bridget his bride among them with a sad and a gay face. The dancers crowded around him, and many a sweet thing said. And a young man brought him red wine, and a young girl white bread. But Bridget drew him by the sleeve away from the merry bands to old men playing at cards with a twinkling of ancient hands. The bread and the wine had a doom, for these were the host of the air, and he sat and he played in a dream of her long dim hair. He played with the merry old men and thought not of evil chance until one bore Bridget his bride away from the merry dance. And he bore her away in his arms the handsomest young man there, and his neck and his breast and his arms were drowned in her long, dim hair. And O'Driscoll scattered the cards, and out of his dream awoke, and old men and young men and young girls were gone like a drifting smoke. And he heard high up in the air a piper piping away, and never was piping so sad, and never was piping so gay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I went and saw the Chieftains last night at Davies Symphony Hall, and I've been feeling real Irish all day long. Um, so, here's something from a book called Not Ray. And I've read the, these here before. This is called Michael Quirk. Michael Quirk is a shaper of songs of the old gods and heroes in oil rubbed and scented woods, carved into shields and trees and the Axis Mountains, emblems of giant pigs and honorable hounds and the wise and prophetic salmon in every way, everywhere spins the spiral. Michael Quirk the diviner of space with arms that are maps of rivers, cuts and lures the song from wood to air. Michael Quirk says, Now I prefer the spiral to the yin and yang because you can have a half a yin and yang, but you can't have half a spiral. With the spiral, it's all or nothing. Now do you know what you have when you have a yin or you have a yang? You have a salmon that's leaping. And would you be knowing why he's leaping? It's because he's seen the hound at the bottom of the sea. Now you will never see the hound, the great and hungry hound of the deep. But I tell you, if you were to hear him baying, I think it's maybe time to take a vacation. <laughs> So that was an Irish poem. Let's read a San Francisco poem.
Francisco, San Francisco. This is from a thin line between the city and the sea. From the top of the high hill, I can see the mists hanging where I knew fields and lanes lay dark amid park forests. I stood between heaving storms, listening to silence, to emptiness. The howling and horizontal rain had driven everyone <coughs> indoors. And within this momentary still, I could hear the not distant waves crashing upon rocks and sand. Storm without and storm within, I stand here in the in-between, between the impulse and thought, and like the pern unto a gyre, to still the inner and outer desires. And within this momentary still, I could hear the twinkle of leaves, like the sea in 10,000 shells of green hanging on a eucalyptus. I stand here in the in-between, between the precious and the rude. In right I'll pour the milk and honey and pray to ear their whispers. The earth is a multiplicity, the mother of 10,000 things. And the sea is the great leveler. All is rendered by the sea to sea. I stand here in the in-between, where they cling like lovers, so twirl new passions into the world. Okay. Um, it's another section of a thin line between the city and the sea. I saw four moons. One upon each window, each twisted by cheap glass, all the illumination needed to silver dark empty streets, ashy cement, asphalt pitch, which could not see or be seen by the moon. Such is the nature of mirrors, moon splashes off the windows to pool upon the sidewalk where she did tread lightly. O oh, bright moon, lifeless bone, scarred, airless, no light of your own, turning shadows into milk or snow, so light her footfall, so light are you, the impression she leaves holds no memory of her shade. She's not immortal, simply fatal, softer than flesh, harder than nacre, She'll massage you with nettles, tender emotions I tried to succor, made of moonlight upon the ocean she scoured with imagination. Oh, moonlight upon the ocean, white path to the horizon, I'd follow you, but my soul is heavier than your glimmer across her mask of water, and drowning is too easy. Rather, let it be murder. To be pushed into a pyre, caressed by love's live coals. To scream in an agony of light, metamorphosis, brilliant, martyred moon. I lost you to ashes. O moon upon the window, O moon upon the ocean, O oh, moon upon the martyred, O oh, moon, you barren stone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a section out of the thin line on the raven. <coughs> Old man raven, ancient bird, Spread great wing feathers like fingers or scimitars to grip or split the vapor above the roof. It settled upon a second. Old man raven sings obscene odes, or are they carrion lullabies? From behind the tall slats of a gray facade, I hear him clack, 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 
them strike his broad beak upon a rock or a brick or a stick, then through a crack in a tall gray fence I see him hop. He attacks a mound, something still upon the ground, and I hear the puncture, the tear, the hiss of gas, and then the squeal of plastic being pulled apart. Old man Raven gluts on the viscera. I've watched him work as meticulous as an archaeologist as he picked over the early morning plastic middens piled steaming in the bitter late winter air along the dark deserted boulevard. Old man Raven, ancient bird, knows where all the secrets are discarded where all the softest, saddest organs lie, where fear and shame are piping hot. An old man raven, ancient bird, swallows it whole with a thing like dignity as if it were nectar or ambrosia, as if it were the body or the blood. Yeah. is from a section on the coyote. Standing as dune grass cuts my shins, my cheeks whipped by sandy winds, as I stand upon the cold coyote tracks, does the coyote know my sins? He and I have crossed paths before. In October snow in Yosemite, I saw him trotting <coughs> towards the river. He paused mid-stride to look at me. He and I have crossed paths before. In the deep night when no one saw him trotting over the golden gate, the parks of Orpheus that span the meaning of the waters. He and I have crossed paths before found dark tracks in the silver dew, shrouding the meadows in the morning, trotting from his secret murders. He and I have crossed paths before, and now I stand upon his bold track. He woke me with howling hymns about ancient sins against the goddess. sat in my campsite, stretching sore legs, slowly growing stiff after hours of upward mobility beneath a full pack. Extra layers of wool, nylon, dried fruit and nuts, chocolate, a tent and a bag, maps and incantations. Legs that had been jelly and heat from stomping rocky shelves hiking through stands of pine and fir across wide fields of wild flowers, legs that were now turning cold and brittle and pain. I sat sipping lukewarm coffee and chewing upon jack cheese as I watched the sun sink behind the silent flood of fog, a world in motion turning from Rembrandt orange to a gray immersion. It was then that I caught at the foggy edge of my sight, a long brush of a tail held stiffly behind a shade, fleeing swiftly across the deepening green shadows. It moved so much faster than my tired mind. But I got up swiftly and rushed to the bush that had dissolved into and found myself standing at the cliff edge of the campground all flat and brown and ringed with short shrubs, too clean to be wild. The camp had that empty ring of human precision. And standing at the fridge, fringe of the lofty roost cut into a mountain peak, I gazed past sheer valleys, 
deepening in shadows of tall pine and fir and hemlock and even redwood where the tectonic pleading of the ground about flattened near the coast. And looking onto a clearing some half a mile away, it was then I saw a distinct apparition, a ghostly glow, white moving slowly amid the dark green and gray. And I ran back to my pack to retrieve my binoculars and then ran carelessly the twilight back to the hedge to peer through the lenses, through the graying of air, and on the far, far meadow caught my ashen quarry. It was a deer of pure white, but for dark eyes and the pink on its fuzzy young antlers, oblivious to me a good half mile away, gasping delighted at its casual ways as it browsed on low grasses and on the young shoots on shrubs on young pine and fir. And it glowed brighter and brighter as the light around it fled until it was hidden as I was hidden as the hemlock was hidden by the wisdom of the darkness, the fog-bound point rays night. And I turned back to my campsite, to the red womb of my tent, and was stopped short by what appeared on the hill rising steeply behind the camp. Twenty white deer, Close enough, I could hear them snuffling and see their hot breath in the cool air, calmly browsed on summer grasses and chewed upon the wild flowers. And with a forced timidity to approximate stealth, I approached them. But the rattle of pebbles and the crackle of summer detritus beneath my cautious feet responded like timpani across the quiet hill and twenty noble-headed phantoms rose as one skittish thought, and like an old memory melted swiftly into the soggy murk as I stood speechless and shivering with awe and doubt. Yeah. with this. I wrote this today. When I am dead, and when I am dead, let their dirges be sung to the turban-mad twirl of the dervish and hun on the fields of the twilight as the moon loves the sun. <clears throat> and when I am dead, I will leave not a mark except for these poems that I carve on the heart of the veil of night as Venus fucks Mars. <laughs> and when I am dead, why then build me a pyre of my books and my poems, consign me to fire. Oh, play me rude cantos of the ruin of desire. Yeah. <laughs>